and welcome to This Is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Devin Booth, and today we're here to talk about sim racing, but not in the way you'd expect. We're taking a trip down memory lane to the era of bell-bottom jeans and cabinet gaming. The star of today's show are the arcades that started it all. With their dated aesthetics and mechanical hearts, it's easy to discount how much of an effect they have really had on what we see as sim racing today. But we can't forget that without the penny arcades and the kids to film, that our hobbies very well may not exist as they do now. So getting past the pixels, the frame rate, the sounds, and all of that kind of stuff in relation to our current titles, and changing our perspective to that of a kid in the 70s, you can totally see how these games blew people away, both young and old. It's easy to discount these titles as clunky, but when you really look into it, these games came to be because of the passion of the developers. Game designers weren't the rock stars they are today, specifically in Western culture. They were the geeks and the basement dwellers, were at one time outcasts in a society where you had stiffs on one side calling for a strong work ethic, you had hippies on the other calling for peace and unity, but in the shadows there was all of the younger versions of us, the nerds, and they poured their hearts into these projects, doing everything that they could to make their dreams a reality, and to in turn bring wants we didn't even know that we had yet into the world. It all began in 1973. In 1972, Atari introduced the world to Pong, a story many of you will know, but shortly afterwards, on July 16th of 1973, Atari gave us another little gem, a little two-player game by the name of Space Race. Now, I know what you're thinking, it's not sim racing, and I kind of get that, it's in space for crying out loud, but it created an inch, and a little scratching was necessary, so bam! Atari subsidiary Cyan Engineering gets to work on the design, and in the not-so-distant month the following year, in May, Grand Track is released. Okay, so the real history buffs among you might be screaming at the screen right now. What about Indy 500 and Speedway? But yeah, you know, I get it. There's a handful of other games out there, and they came out in like 68, 69, but they're really hard to find footage for. So if you want to remember that we're talking about the 60s, and that there was, you know, some other things that we're not going to talk about going on, uh, you kind of give us a little bit of a break, all right? So we've acknowledged the fact that I'm going to miss some stuff, and then we're just going to completely ignore it, and pretend that that never happened. Grand Track 10 is released, and players are given a wheel and pedals to control their very first virtual race car. A driver is given a single track layout, and your score is based off of the distance traveled during the time limit. Hitting pylons that denote the edge of the track will cause you to spin out, and there's an oil slick out there for something a little extra spicy. Later on, they even tossed another steering wheel in the cabinet and gave us a real race. Two players. Things were starting to roll along at a good pace in the gaming world. But this is also where you start to see people cloning games. And the water gets a little muddy here, so we're going to focus on the big boys. First of which is 1974's Taito Speed Race. First released in Japan, later coming to America in 1975, licensed by Midway, this beauty treated users to a fully functional analog tack and digital speedometer. Uh, another top-down entry, Speed Race had you driving down a long straight highway, dodging traffic in an effort to beat the high score of those that came before. But what if you don't want to race against those scores from before? And maybe you want to race more than one friend in GT20. Well, don't worry, it's 1975 and Indy 800 is here to party. Eight racers, eight screens, eight of everything, but endless amounts of fun. Indy 800 is a personal favorite of the Simpit. This was Sean's first real entry into sim racing. Eight drivers on a top-down track with the screens angled so you could build up an audience. This is what the arcade experience was all about. Color displays, beautifully designed cabinet, made this one one of the most memorable games of the decade, and it would go on to have a few sequels as well as copies with the addition of AI and added imagery to keep the user's experience going for years that followed. During that time, we also got a few lost gems like 1976's Fawns by Sega. TV's hottest name, your hottest game. This early motorbike game put the player behind the handlebars as one of history's most notable characters. Introducing the third-person chase cam perspective and adding a character like Fonzie was probably one of the best moves to be made at the time. Originally released in Japan as Road Race, this title instantly gained success and was rebranded Man TT and Motocross before settling on the Fonz as the owners of Sega's American branch had alleged ties to Paramount Television at the time. We also got our first sit-down title with Racer by Midway. We talked about this one earlier, Taito Speed Race. In 1976, this title came to America as Racer and Wheels, and we loved it. So much so that Wheels 2 and the updated Speed Race DX went on to be among the most top-grossing games of the year, Wheels beating out Indy 800 for its spot on the American podium, and Speed Racer DX with a solid second place in Japan, following that up with the golden first place in 77. Great success, Taito Speed Race. 
Along with these games, we were given our first look at the first-person perspective with Nurburgring 1 and Night Driver. Now, the story goes that the boys over at Atari are given a picture. German, a little vague, and with dashes denoting the side of the road, and what kind of looks like the front end of a car sticking out from the bottom of the screen. They're told to create a first-person driving game like nobody's seen before, and so they grab up some of the old highway cabinets they got lying around, and they get to work on what will soon become Night Driver. Players are finally able to sit in a cabinet and look at the hood of their car. The open road ahead, they can drive to their heart's content as long as they've got enough quarters. <laughs> this title ended up with so much staying power that it was actually ported over to the Atari console and the Commodore 64, truly standing the test of time in a way that not many games manage. That is, though, getting ahead of myself, so let's back it up a bit. For the remaining two or three years of the decade, we get a lot of clones, some fun little gems, and Sprint 2 introduces the microprocessor, but the standout for me has honestly got to be the fire truck. I know it's not a racing game, but it's the perfect parent kid arcade gem. Two sets of controls for the user, you go on a little top-down adventure in which the main driver controls the front of the truck, with the second controllers taking hold of the rear. You're presented with the perfect little disaster of glitchy physics attempts, and it's I, you can't help but enjoy it, and it is what made arcades stand the test of time. These are the kinds of things that people remember when they look back at this decade. Now, when I finished up the research for this video, I came to the realization that while today we see sim racing as a niche within a niche within a gaming genre that's seen as a niche itself, that our need for speed and the passion that kids grew up with at the arcade went a long way towards changing things from just the casual experience playing games to the pursuit of what would ultimately become our community's binding force, which is sim racing. And what a trip it was. I know I skimmed past a few titles and presented things in what might be an odd way, but I really wanted to focus on the titles that started the drive to create a racing experience that anyone could safely enjoy. These are the titles that I thought had the most impact on our genre. But if you disagree, comment down below and let us know what tickles your nostalgia the most. I'd love to hear anything I missed, and it really was a trip going through the list, so disagree with me, let's have some conversations down there, I'd love to hear it. Part two will take us into the 80s, and while I've got some notes prepared, I didn't want to get too far ahead without giving you guys the chance to join in. Comment down below with any suggestions on titles to include in our second chapter, and if you've got pictures from the 80s, even better, Discord's linked down below in the video description as well. We'd love to see your old setups. And we'd love to see what gave you guys your start. I'd love to use that footage in the upcoming video. That said, it is time for me to wrap it up. So check out our patron, patron.com slash the sim pit. Like this video, hit subscribe. All of those things go a long way towards helping out what we're doing over here with the sim pit. That said, one last time, I'm Devin Booth, and we will see you on the track.